Success. Eyes that mock our sacred institutions. Bedroom eyes, they call them in a bygone day. Sex desire is the most powerful of human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge in. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness of imagination, courage, etc., which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or in any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. Napoleon Hill. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec. I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Angel B. Hartwell. How you doing, Angel? I am super awesome, Michelle. It's summer here in New England, and there's nothing better than summer here in New England. So I'm doing great. Nice. Well, thank you for being here with us. I appreciate you taking the time because uh, I know that is probably the perfect place to be is outside, not in a podcast. But, but hey, we're going to have some fun first. So I got to tell you guys, when I first met Angel, we absolutely fell in love. It was super fun, adorable, and has some awesome information for you. So if you could give our peeps a 5,000 foot view of who you are and what you do, that would be an epic start. Awesome. Well, I have been in the personal and professional development space for the last 13 years. Prior to that, I was in real estate development space, and I was uh, at the end of that career developing with two partners, 51 single family houses, 56 apartments, and an office building, and the national chair of my trade association. And then I had a spiritual awakening. And uh, as a result of that spiritual awakening, I, I ended up getting into this space and I've actually helped people from all over the world and been hurt by millions of people from all over the world, um, you know, helping primarily women, although a few very wise men uh, have worked with me. Uh, to really uh, answer wholeheartedly their calling and to be able to structure themselves and their business and their life to be able to convert their wisdom into wealth. I like to call it wisdom to wealth. So that's a little bit about me. And I've, I've generated multiple millions from home in my pajamas or my yoga pants and sometimes in my bikini because I use the power of my voice to share my message with people all over the world. So today I have my yoga pants on for you. <laughs> For those of you who are not watching this, <laughs> she is fully clothed at this point, as far as we know. <laughs> That's awesome. So tell me about your spiritual awakening. What happened? How to go down? Do we get the deeds? Ah, sure. Yeah. So I was um, in a phase in my life. I was literally with these two partners developing this huge multi-million dollar project. I was the national chair of my trade association and um, my son had gone through a very traumatic experience um, that kind of traumatized the whole family. And as a result of all of that, I ended up um, getting, I, I was spending some time with him and I ended up injuring myself skiing. And uh, after that skiing injury, I got turned on to yoga. And before that, I had been like a gym person. You know, I was at the gym, I was doing the gym thing. And, um, so I couldn't do the gym because I had in injured myself. And so I got turned on to yoga. And about three months into the yoga practice, maybe three or four months into the yoga practice, she took us out to the park. And I was lying on the ground at the end of yoga. And all of a sudden, I had what I now know was my third eye popped open. And in that popping open of my third eye, I, I could see in my mind's eye, all of these golden white orbs of light and angels going up and down a staircase, which I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I sat up and I opened up my physical eyes and everyone in the park was a golden white orb of light. And that was a little freaky. A little freaky. <laughs> a little freaky. <laughs> That is awesome. So yeah. what did you do? Well, so the most important thing that I want to uh, say to anybody who's having any kind of interesting experiences like this is um, you're not crazy. 
<laughs> and, Good to know. and I am really grateful that at the time I had a community, it was loose knit, you know, cause I was only in the yoga community for a few months when this happened, but I had a community of people around me um, and the teacher herself who were able to affirm me in my experience. And so like the first thing I want to say to anybody who's listening is if you're having a, an interesting experience, shall I say, <laughs> that doesn't make sense, a supernatural experience that um, happens. And it doesn't have to be as dramatic as mine was, but you know, whether it's an opening of your psychic gifts or a, you know, a, a, an experience, a near death experience or a spiritual awakening similar to what I had with my third eye popping open, uh, you are not crazy and you don't necessarily need to trot yourself off to the psychiatrist and get drugs, uh, which if I had not had that community, I probably would have immediately taken myself off to the psychiatrist. <laughs> and been like, I'm losing my mind. I'm crazy. Um, but I didn't. And, and as a result of that uh, small tight knit, but you know, I was loosely connected to community I was able to continue to affirm that experience that I had and continue to affirm and pursue uh, kind of expanding my, my um, willingness to dismantle a lot of things that I believed about the way life was structured uh, and to open up to other possibilities. And, and so, you know, kind of fast forward, it, it was an experience that literally changed my life forever, uh, you know, precipitated my first divorce from my first husband, um, precipitated changing my career, div divorcing my business partners, precipitated stepping into a healing space, learning about things about myself that I didn't even know existed. I, I discovered my inner author and I discovered my inner artist and I discovered my inner presenter and I discovered my inner performer. And I gave myself permission to allow the old structure of my life that was very left-brained. I mean, I was a real estate developer. You know, it was all about the bottom line and how many foundations we could put in in a certain amount of time and getting the, the units sold and all the things. I, I had to let that go for a long period of time to allow the space for other other experiences and other parts of me that had been latent for many years to start to emerge and to blossom. And so ultimately I ended up like really letting myself go, the old self and expanding into this new place. And then I discovered that I had gone so far away from the left brain real estate side of things. Uh, and I needed to come back together. You know, I needed to bring the best of both worlds together. So. Now, when I'm working with people, it's all about both the possibilities as well as like the bottom line practical profitability because they've got to be married. Um, otherwise, you know, you become out of balance in the other direction. Nice. That is fantastic. And I'm totally jealous. Uh, I've interviewed people that have you know, past life experiences, people who have, you know, near death experiences or they've been dead and they've come back. And I'm like, well, I was flatlined. I didn't have any vision. <laughs> that I remember and it's like oh man that sounds like so much fun in a really weird acid trip sort of way <laughs> it's like... well and so let me say to you Michelle that um when I first started in that spiritual journey and in that spiritual awakening I was started suddenly surrounded by people who were seeing like they were seeing right I had that one oh your voice your sound cut out oh there you so... go you're back yeah, so I had that one experience where I saw these golden white orbs of light and, and literally it lasted for so long that I was like, am I gonna see this way forever? It was like a little freaky for me, but eventually it faded away. And then I wasn't seeing anything anymore, but I was surrounded by all these other people who were seer, we'll call them seers, you know, clairvoyant. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, I'm not seeing anything. <laughs> Right, the bottom of the What's wrong with me? I'm not seeing anything. I had that one thing happen, and now I'm not seeing anything. And and what I became clear about is that there are multiple ways of receiving spiritual information. And so, you know, maybe your near death experience 
imprinted you in a different way. Maybe it made you, and I'm going to just say what I'm seeing, it maybe made you exponentially more sensitive than you probably were before. Mm -hmm. And you are maybe more clairsentient and it got that to come online than you might have been before. Whereas for others, it might make them more clairvoyant or clairaudient, which is hearing, you know, you mm -hmm. start to hear messages or what I discovered my major Claire was is Claire cognizant, which is I have a whole body knowing, like it just drops right in as a whole body knowing. And sometimes I see stuff in my mind's eye and sometimes I hear stuff, but the main um, Claire that's kind of like my baseline is Claire cognizant. So I'm, I'm betting if you went through a near death experience of flatline, Michelle, that there's an imprint somewhere that either is latent and not yet quite germinated or that you just haven't acknowledged yet how it changed you cool well i can't wait until it <laughs> shows up and uh and i would love to start seeing in technicolor because that'd just be super fun i think <laughs> that arm might freak out and go okay i didn't mean it <laughs> no, <laughs> be careful what you ask for <laughs> exactly you know so how does how, how does all of this help somebody create wealth this is a great question. So, um, <laughs> the, yeah, the first thing that the, the first thing that I want to say about this is when you've gone through a process where everything that you believed up until now suddenly comes into question mm -hmm. and you start to open yourself up and discover all of these other latent pieces within you that you have to give permission to express, um, they all have value. Everything has value. And so how does this convert to creating wealth? Well, first of all, it's about structuring the value that you have to offer in a way that you can um, communicate it into the marketplace and enroll for that exchange of, of income right? For that, mm -hmm. for that money to come in. And in my case, what I needed to do was I needed to actually bring together my practical side. You know, I spent 20 years in the real estate business. I know how to do math, right? I know how to structure business models. I know how to market. We were an award-winning marketing. Um, we won a, a marketing award for our model home. So I understood and had all of those experiences and, and skills and expertise and then when I had the spiritual awakening and found all these other latent parts of me that I gave permission to flourish, the work for me was to find out how to weave them all together in a way that would be interesting and um, worthy of investment from the people that I'm making offers to. And, and there's a, a little bit more that goes into this than just that, but at the, at the core, business is very simple. Business is have something great to sell, sell it, communicate out into the market that you have it, right? Have the selling conversations and sell it, serve it, whether it's a service or a product, and then celebrate your success and go back and do it again, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's really, really simple. It really is that easy. <laughs> well, that's that simple. It really is that simple. Yeah. Absolutely. Really so what do you think is the biggest thing that, that holds somebody back from them? Well, um, for women, mostly it's that they don't understand the value that they, that they carry. And we are socially and culturally conditioned to devalue ourselves and to put ourselves in second place and to um, be volunteers. I mean, my mother's generation, I'm sure your mother's generation, and there was spillover into our generation uh, still, you know, it was all about volunteering. I talk to a lot of people who are just like, oh yeah, I have to do this because it's my calling and I'm not thinking about the money. Well, that's great until you run out of money. How are you serving your calling if you're running out of money? I just had a conversation with somebody today who's really, really called to serve into a completely untapped market, completely untapped. Wow. And she is the perfect person to serve into that market. And she's been investing out of her own savings and out of her own, um, you know, her own nest egg to build a business that is not structured properly. Mm -hmm. It's not structured properly because she's trying to do 
too many things for too many people at too low of a price point. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just really important to understand the value of what you have to offer and to get very clear on what the minimum revenue is that you require in order to thrive. Because Mm -hmm. if you are the business owner or the messenger, if you're not thriving, you're the vessel that through which all of this is being generated. So if you're not thriving, if you're depleting yourself, ultimately the entire thing is going to collapse because you can only run on, you know, smoke and mirrors and, and steam and willpower for so long. So for me, it's really about helping get to the core of the value, dismantling the old volunteer mindset and, and martyrdom mindset and setting up structures so that my clients can thrive financially as well as in their lifestyle. And, and, you know, lifestyle is as important, if not more so than the financial piece, but the financial piece has to serve it. So I like to use the example when I'm speaking and I'm here speaking, right? Anytime I'm presenting, Mm -hmm. if I'm presenting on my own podcast, if I'm presenting as a guest on somebody else's podcast, if I'm on a teleseminar or telesummit and I'm sharing my message, when I'm speaking, that presentation is intentioning, intentionally serving my business model. It's, it's an opportunity for people to connect with me. It's an opportunity for me to offer something that will allow them to go further with me. The, the present presentation time is devoted and dedicated to serving my business. My business is set up to serve my life. And my life requires time for healthcare, time for time in nature, time for spiritual pursuits, time for making art, time for having conversations with my team that are not really paid for. And the only thing that I'm actually paid for is when I'm service delivering to someone. So you have to have all those calculations in place. And if I'm not thriving personally, no amount of money makes sense. So, you know, we have to be really mindful about structuring things in a way that's going to allow the golden goose to keep laying the eggs. Nice. I love that. I got to quit saying nice. I love that. But I, it's nice and I love that. <laughs> I, I'm riding a little hobby horse, but I love that because I think a lot of people get stuck on the whole idea of, well, people can't afford if I charge as much as I need to charge because that's what I'm hearing in the marketplace. How do you address people that have that kind of argument? Uh, you cannot afford to build a business that's bleeding all day, every day. You just can't, right? But yeah, I mean, if you think of your business as an, as one of your appendages, and it is, and like it's that appendage that brings in the value. So it's as as important as your arms and your hands, if not more so. Like, and if it was severed and bleeding, what would you do to it? You obviously you'd heal it and take care of it, and nurture it. Why would why don't people do that to their businesses? Like, well, because they aren't clear on um, long term vision. Mm -hmm. because they aren't clear on, again, their own value and the value of what they're offering, and because they aren't clear on how to appropriately communicate it. And I have to, as a side note, talk about the current culture. So I got started in this business in 2008, 2009 timeframe, where we didn't have like Zoom and video and stuff. We had YouTube, but it was cranky and you know <laughs> so we barely we're, we're dial up you know I mean we maybe weren't, weren't quite so bad as dial up but we were like at the beginning of fiber optics we didn't have a whole lot of megabytes available to us and um and so I got started just using the phone I got started on teleseminar lines and and just using the phone and what has emerged over the last 13 years is this noisy carnival barking shiny, splashy, let's have 150,000 people following you and, you know, pushing the little heart button on your Instagram and you're not making any freaking money. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Logically, it's not logical. So I help my people to get very clear that it's better to have a small group 
of highly invested people that you're working with who themselves are going to make massive impact in the world and thereby you are making massive impact through them, right? My clients collectively have generated about $100 million over the last 13 years. Mm -hmm. So that $100 million represents actual transformation that's happening. Mm -hmm. Way more than 150,000 heart buttons. 150,000 heart buttons with no money connected to it is just dopamine hits. And it doesn't make sense because it's not making dollars. So I personally would rather have a small, highly invested group of people and be, be feeding and developing that and be constantly putting opportunities for them to invest in themselves in front of them than I am in building a gigantic, I mean, I have a huge audience with my, my um, podcast, Wickedly Smart Women, we're in 87 countries but I'm building the podcast to serve my business. I'm not building the podcast to serve my ego. I'm not building the podcast because I'm going after X thousand zillion downloads. I'm, I'm building the podcast to be a public service, number one, to be the way that people get connected to me, the portal through which people get connected to me, where then we can go further with one another, number two, and uh, number three, as a platform to really elevate, celebrate, and spotlight my colleagues, my clients, and my clients to be. So it's very intentional. The, the podcast is very intentional. And you know, if I someday have 150,000 people who are pushing the little heart button on my podcast Instagram page, great. I'll celebrate that. But that's not what I'm aiming for. What I'm aiming for is being of service to people who are invested because the people who are invested are the ones who are actually going to be creating impact. Nice. So who would you say is your favorite client? Who do you love to serve and support? Oh, all right. So I really love to serve and support people who are called. And for me, the calling is a combination of things. It is the desire of your own heart to make a contribution into the world, a very specific, generally change evoking. I like to work with change agents and thought leaders um, that they, there's a calling that, that is undeniable, that they have to make this contribution into the world. And the calling, it, it comes from their own heart and their own spirit. It's like, it's the commitment is so deep to answering that calling, no matter what. The calling is not only their desire to serve and their contribution, but it is also, it's, it's this beautiful dynamic thing. The calling exists because there are people out in the world who are praying for the unique solution that Michelle can offer. They are praying for the solution to the problem that Michelle can solve or Angel can solve or my client Lisa can solve or they are praying for the fulfillment of a desire that either Michelle or Angel or Lisa or you know um, Crystal or any of the other people that I've worked with can solve, mm -hmm. uh, can, can provide or they are praying for the rite of passage from one state of being into another state of being that uh, working with somebody like yourself or myself can provide. So when people come to work with me, they generally have, a, have this big calling. They've, they have people out there praying for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise they wouldn't be feeling the calling. And they are really looking to fulfill the desire to create wealth from their wisdom because they know that the wealth is going to allow this wisdom itself, this body of work that we co-create with one another, it will allow the wisdom to live on after them and have impact after them. And this is why it's so important to have the money piece in the equation. Nice. I love that. Again, so give us a, an example of a Cinderella story. Ooh, a Cinderella story. <laughs> I love this question from one of my clients or from myself, which from you clients. Say? Huh? From your clients. Okay, great. Um, I have a client who came to work with me. Uh, she did my wired up for wealth body of work. 
she had worked for her dad for most of her life as an accountant, making about $30,000 a year. And she came in to do the work with me. Uh, the work with her was less practical and more spiritual. So when I come to the table with somebody, it's both. It's the spiritual and the practical. Mary, but some people need a little more of the spiritual side. Some people need a little more of the practical side. Sometimes it's, it's just even Stephen on both sides. In her case, she needed more of the psycho-spiritual emotional support to acknowledge the value that she had to offer and to be able to communicate that clearly into the marketplace, but also to be able to get extremely clear on who her right fit people were from an energetic level. Mm -hmm. And we did three months of work together. I think it was Ju June, July, August, or July, August, September. And in October, she went to a live event walked into that live event where there was 600 people, came out because she was energetically emanating the invitation to her right fit clients, came out with seven business cards. Instead of chasing after 600 people to get everybody's business card, I mean, how many people have done that? At live events? <laughs> well, or worse, to give away 600 cards. <laughs> right, or give away 600 cards. And you know that those things are going to be fodder for the fire sooner or later, exactly. right? It's, and, and what's anybody going to actually do with them? Anyway, she came out with seven business cards yep. on a Saturday, got home Sunday, got a, on a call with one of those business cards Monday and turned it into a $7,500 client on the spot on that call on Monday. By the end of the month of October, she emailed me and sent me a message that said, I have five figures in period, the period, bank, exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, and from years of just making $30,000 a year with her dad, she was able to create a five figure month for herself. Oh, uh, and beautiful. subsequently gone on from there to now she's married. She has two kids. She runs her business part time and she's making at least a quarter million dollars a year, maybe more with her business. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. And cool. more importantly, she's got the lifestyle. Like yes. she's making a quarter million dollars a year part time. Yay. And, and giving her the rest of her time to raising and, and parenting her two lovely little babies. I can tell you how many conversations I've had with people over the years of how important it is to incorporate the lifestyle into your business plan. And I always said, if nothing else, just go play golf on Friday. Like call it a networking event, do what you got to do. <laughs> but like, just no. And it, it boggled people how much more effective they became in those four days than they were trying to wrangle in a 12 hour days, seven days a week in some cases. I'm like, no, eight hour days maximum, four days a week, go play golf on Friday and see what happens. And we just started booking it in and, and they were, it was awesome. I love that she gets to spend time with her kids. It's beautiful. Well, and, 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 you know, what you're speaking to there is that not only have we been culturally conditioned to be volunteers, We've also been culturally conditioned to be on an industrial era time structure that yeah. if you have your own business, you get to create whatever the heck you want. I mean, my business, Tuesday is my big day. Wednesday is also a big day for me. Thursday, I take the day off. I call it my breather day and I do whatever the hell I want on Thursday. Sometimes I have phone calls with people if I feel like it but it's my breather day. I don't get started on Monday till four o'clock in the afternoon and I finish on Friday, no later than two. So you get to create whatever you want. Do I sometimes work on Saturday night? Yup. You know, but it's my choice. I'm actually the artist and creator of my structures. And so part of the work is to develop a business model and an offer and a price point that will allow you to thrive. And part of thriving means in, in your case, you were sharing to have people go play golf, whatever it takes to get them to deconstruct this thought form that they have to be working from nine to five, 80 hours a week, hundred hours a week. I mean, it, that's not efficient. It's not the highest and best use of your life. And if you're in this uh, world to create conscious change, like my clients are, 
it's a marathon. It's an endurance thing. It's, you know, we're not going to do it all today, but what we want to do is we want to set up the structure for long-term sustainable impact. And that starts with making sure that you have a baseline of thriving financially, as well as physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Fantastic. And that's a wealthy life, Michelle. It is, that's it is. I love life. having this conversation. I love helping people to be able to do that. And, and I know that it's so, so necessary. Um, but what do you think some of the stumbling blocks might be that somebody's having right now? And they're thinking, oh my God, Angel, I need you so badly right now. Yeah, they're addicted to being busy. They are seduced. They've been seduced by the culture <laughs> of busy. <laughs> and um, part of the culture of busy and part of that seduction is this overlay of um, Catholic. I mean, pretty much the origin is Catholic, but it, it goes across other religious um, cultures as well. This guilting, right? Mm -hmm. this guilting. If you're not doing something, you're lazy. Or if you're not doing something, you know, you know, you're a parasite or whatever. Um, and, and really understanding that your, um, your intellect and your energy and your insights can have extraordinary value to someone who's not seeing things in that way and can open up their lives in a way that is magical that, that they can't open up any other way than by working with you. So, you know, I think it's really important to start to uh, emphasize how much has to be dismantled mm -hmm. in order to turn your wisdom into wealth. A lot of cultural conditioning, family conditioning, societal conditioning, uh, educational conditioning that, that we were habituated to as children uh, mm -hmm. that is now, it, it does, it's not a fit for what I call the creative age. We were conditioned for the industrial age, but industrial age production is declining, has declined immensely in the US. Uh, we went into this period of the intellectual property age, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was all about information, the information age, even the information age, there's so much information out there. It's like a gigantic wall of chaos. Now it's about being in the creative age. And in the creative age, we actually get to consciously craft our life, our business, our offer, and our impact. And so helping people to take ownership and res personal responsibility for what it is that they're creating and helping them to really put the flashlight on, you know, is this really sustainable? I just was on the phone with a woman and I was like, this isn't sustainable. You, you know, you're like a balloon with a pinhole in it. I said, what happens to a balloon with a pinhole in it? <laughs> Eventually. And, and she's got this vast vision. that's really a hundred year vision. So wow. sometimes you have to hire somebody too to help you to see what you're not seeing, Michelle. Yeah. That's why people come to you. That's why people come to me. Because if you're not seeing it and you know that it should be working better, then you need somebody from the outside to come in and see what you're not seeing and support you to make the changes that are gonna allow you to actually thrive and, and live what I like to call a wealthy life by design. Absolutely. And I think it's so important to be able to see that thing because that one thing can be a catalyst and you just turn around and go, oh, okay, I get it. And now you do something differently and it can have an immediate impact. So. I mean, yes, sometimes you got to work with people for three months to get through the stuff. And sometimes it can just be that one little smack and, and they're gobsmacked and they don't realize what they never realized. It's, exactly. It's, and and a lot of it's simplification, Michelle, more than anything, it's simplification. Yeah. I mean, people are just addicted to the culture of busy and um, figure if they're doing more that they're going to earn more. And, and it's really not the, not the case at all. Totally like, not true. It really isn't. I mean, how many people imagine, imagine, Michelle, that we're at a live event, which it's been a while since anybody's been at a live <laughs> event. But imagine that you're at a live event and somebody's up on the stage speaking and they're like, come on with me. 
and you can feel their <laughs> like freneticism, right? Yeah. And how many people are going, there are going to be people who are going to be sparked by that. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, because there's a lot of people who believe in the culture of busy. They're seduced by the culture of busy. But wise people are going to say, this is carnival barky stuff. This, this is not... This is not something that I actually want to add for energy into my life. Well, now imagine somebody who's standing on the stage and they are centered and they're relaxed and they're serving, but they're not spewing mm -hmm. and they are inviting. You know, if this is, if, if you want to create something like this, you need to have a conversation with me. You know, and if it's a fit to have a conversation with me, great. And if not, great. And to be able to be in that state of confidence that you are thriving, regardless of whether or not somebody comes out of the audience and gives you their business card, and wants to have a conversation with you. Um, you know, I think the vast majority of people, the wise people are going to choose the more centered, the more grounded, the more confident the more clear uh, option. Nice. So I know that somebody listening to this is going, thinking like, I need to get more of you. So how did they begin their journey with you? Well, I have a fun quiz. It's called the Wealthy Life Readiness Quiz. And you can get that at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. It's a fun little quiz that will give you a result on a scale. There's like three different uh, results that are available. Either you are in big trouble and need some help right away, <laughs> or you're doing great, or you're somewhere in the middle. And generally speaking, most of the people who end up working with me are either somewhere in the middle or they're doing great and they want that one little extra tweak, like you were mentioning earlier, Michelle, that one little extra tweak that is going to be what one of my mentors calls the elegant move, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that reminds me of the story of the trim tab. So if, if you don't know about the story of the trim tab, I will share with you that if you are going to move the, the, one of the gigantic cruise ships, mm -hmm. the gigantic cruise ship has this big rudder on the back. And the big rudder, when it moves to the left, it moves the ship to the right. When it moves to the right, it moves the ship to the left. But what's moving the big rudder? This little tiny thing called the trim tab. And the trim tab, if the boat's gonna to go to the left, the trim tab goes to the left, which moves the rudder to the right. And it's this little tiny trim tab, that elegant move that can turn a ship the size of you know, a giant cruise ship. So we are looking for those, those elegant moves and, and a reduction of the to-do list and an increase of the get to lay around and enjoy my life list. Yeah, <laughs> I like that one. Awesome. So before I let you go, this has been fantastic, awesome, and amazing. And I love it. And we're going to have to do it again sometime. But I got to know, at what point in life did you know that you were a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? Oh, well, I sold 763 boxes of cookies when I was a Girl Scout when I was nine years old. Oh, all the rest of the Girl Scouts sold, all the rest of the Girl Scouts sold 28 boxes. I sold 763. Um, yeah, entrepreneurship has been part of my journey. My mom had a yarn shop. I learned how to run the cash box in my mom's yarn shop and do the bookkeeping and answer the phone and um put people's yarn in bags and take their money when I was seven years old. So um, that's fun. It, it's in the gene, it's in the genes. I've been, <laughs> I've been in entrepreneurship for a very long time. I did do uh, the corporate thing for a little while. I, I worked for long ago, I worked for a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, which isn't even in existence anymore. And I lasted a year there and it was like, oh my God, I can't do this because <laughs> It's just crazy. Like they wanted me to be there at nine o'clock in the morning. And if I was 10 minutes late, they would have a freak, but then they didn't have any work for me to do. And I would sit there for hours and hours and I do an hour's worth of work. But if I wasn't there nine o'clock, it was a problem. So I, yeah, I can't do that. I can't, I, I'm completely unemployable. 
completely. But I am able to be hired and engaged as a consultant. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. So any last words for our peeps today before we let you go? Because I know you have Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you. I believe that gratitude is the currency of the universe and currency is gratitude in action. So I want to say thank you to you, Michelle, for the opportunity for the platform. I'm really grateful for that. Thank you to anybody who's been listening. And if you've been listening and you are inspired to take action, you know, reach out, take the quiz, but you can also reach out to me directly um, through my website. You can contact me directly through my website and, and apply for a consultation. There's a lovely little button there that you can apply for the consultation. And I would love to have a conversation with you if it's time for you to um, make that elegant move and uh, get your trim tab functioning in your business so that you have a more enjoyable time in your life and you're creating wealth from your wisdom. Awesome, generous offer. And give us your website again, just in case people are rushing to grab a pen and or yes. their phone to type it in. <laughs> www.wealthylifementor.com, wealthylifementor.com. And everything is on that page. So you can access my art gallery. You can access my apply for consultation. You can access my award-winning podcast through that page. Uh, you can access information about booking me to speak. That's like the hub page, uh, Wealthy Life Mentor. And I think the quiz link is on that page as well so yeah awesome what kind of art do you do thanks what kind of art do you do oh i am a both a photographer as well as a painter and i have um acrylic as well as watercolor watercolor got woken up again this year and i made 54 watercolor paintings here's one of them wow here's one of them. that's prolific of trees oh fun yeah, I made 54 watercolor paintings of trees. And uh, so when I get going with my art, it's just like it pours out of me. But right now I'm doing mushroom photography because I learned about mushrooms this winter. I that was my so. winter project. I love them. I had my I first chanterelles. I went out uh, foraging with the Monadnock Mushroom Group. And so I'm now taking photographs. I've got 54 mushrooms or 55 mushrooms in my, in my mushroom collection. So. Wow. I love mushrooms so much that I actually, an artist friend of mine who hated mushrooms, she was grossed out by them, thought they were disgusting and nasty. And by the end of three days with her, <laughs> and when we were out camping, she was taking pictures of mushrooms going, oh, wow, did you see that? <laughs> yeah. I just think they're fascinating. And like, Oh my God, do you eat them? Do you forage and eat them? I don't forage and eat them. I, I'm not savvy enough for that. I just know that's that can be dangerous. But um, my ex, has these fantastic black mushrooms that grow underneath the, the trees out in New Brunswick. Yeah. And, oh my God, they're so good. They they jar them, they do everything with them. Those are my favorite by far. Love the black trumpet. Truffle, but... They're probably the black trumpets. Probably. Yeah, I love them. Well, I took a little course this uh, this winter and 100% guarantee that I know what the hell I'm looking at. And I've also joined a community which, you know, let's talk about community again. I joined a community of mushroom people locally uh, who has, you know, a bunch of people who, if you post a picture and say, I think this is this, can somebody confirm for me? And then you get a lot of people say, oh yeah, that's that, that's that. Or somebody else will say, no, double check and see if it's this. And so, yeah, I, I did eat my first wild foraged mushrooms uh, about two weeks ago and they were amazingly delicious. They were called chanterelles. So it was that awesome. That is awesome. Oh, yes. And my dad had some in his backyard. She goes, oh, yeah, we eat this all the time. And my mom's freaking out going, don't eat that. And we're like, I can eat it. Yeah, you want, and you want to be mindful with, with, with mushrooms for sure. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, so fun. who knew we were going to start talking about mushrooms this i know i love it michelle we're gonna to have to have a little mushrooming adventure with one another at some point or you could go look at my my art gallery and my mushroom collection and if you'd like you can order a shower curtain with a mushroom on it it's a very cool cool gallery you can get shower curtains you can get journals you can get yoga mats you can get coffee cups and so i've got the, it all set up to do all the fun things Absolutely. I'm totally doing that. We're going to wealthylifementor.com in case you guys forgot. Awesome. Well, Angel, it has been absolutely fantastic. Love, love talking to you. So we will do this again sometime. My pleasure. Awesome. Very grateful. Thank you.
You're most welcome. This is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. If you know anyone who would make a great guest for the show or have a question or topic that you'd like me to discuss, reach out to me at michelle at the little blue pill for business.com or connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to the Little Blue Pill for Business podcast with your mistress in business, Michelle Nedelec. Why are you still here? Go to littlebluepillforbusiness.com and get your goodies. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to share it with somebody else that you know would enjoy getting it up in business after you subscribe to the podcast, of course, so you won't miss any future episodes. Now, check the notes for links. Oh, and only tell your wife if she's into this, you know, entrepreneurship. And I'll see you both on the other side.